Welcome to Anthony's Outdoors. Are you guys interested in musky biology, genetics, and stocking programs? Well, the next couple videos that I'll be putting out address just that. I had the opportunity of sitting through a Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources seminar at Treelands Resort on the Chippewa Flowage during their third annual musky bash. The information was awesome. If you're like me and like to nerd out on that kind of stuff, then these videos will be right up your alley. Check them out. Guys, a little bit uh, from the DNR perspective on, on muskies and musky management. Um, originally, it was just going to be me, um, much to your all disappointment. Um, but we're really lucky to have a guest here today. This is Annie Dutton. She is a biologist who's on our statewide musky team, so she is involved in a lot of the policies on muskies all around Wisconsin. And I know many of you probably fish the whole state uh, and are probably from different parts of the state. So what we're going to do is, is Addie's going to start by doing a presentation that kind of talks statewide, looks at how things are done and why things are done certain ways, uh, and then we're going to zoom down and talk about the triple flowage. I'll kind of take over. So um, we'll both be available for questions throughout the evening. We're going to have people hold questions until the end or fire away as they come up. And uh, we'll keep it pretty, you know, free form here and want to get anybody's questions answered tonight about muskies and musky management. So take it away, Addie. Alright, thanks, Matt. So, a little, I figured I'd start with a little bit of a brief intro. So I started as a biologist for the state about two years ago. I originally grew up in Michigan. I did my grad work working on large river obligate species like paddlefish and pallid sturgeon. And I was hired in January of 18. And I was not a musky fanatic by any means. I'd never fished for muskies. I had pretty much no idea about musky management. And as part of my assignment, I was hired on for three county coverage areas. So I cover Sheboygan, Washington, and Fond du Lac counties. So basically halfway in between Green Bay and Milwaukee. And as part of that assignment, I was told I was going to serve on the statewide musky policy team, species team, management team. And it wasn't really a choice. And I said, all right, I'll do it. And I was pretty excited for the opportunity to do something new, fresh, that I didn't know much about at all. Um, and so with that, what our muskie team does is it has about seven key things that we, we really focus on. So we develop and review all the re regulation guidance and proposals across the state. So each lake has a special size, either it has a baseline state wide minimum or it has a special regulation and all regulation proposals come through our species team. So when you see 50 inch minimums, those had to be approved through our team. So that's one of the big things we do. We also develop and review stocking guidance. So as many of you are probably aware, many if not most of the musky fisheries that you guys are primarily targeting are stocked fisheries and muskies are a limited resource in terms of how many we can raise in our hatchery systems and we as a team, we try to filter who can get muskies in terms of how many, the frequency, and all of that. We also develop and review habitat guidance and plans. So we don't do this much, but it's one part of us, one part of our charge. Another is developing sampling protocol and assessments. So we're getting good population estimates, looking at how we can improve stocking guidance based on our sampling protocols and how to better uh, sample especially in large reservoirs and river systems. We're updating the statewide management plan for muskie as a, a species on the whole and assessing the fishery to date. We're identifying any research needs and at times looking for ways we can fund graduate students to do uh, research like the ongoing work on the Green Bay system that some of you might be familiar with. And then finally we're also maintaining and updating muskie water classifications. So I'll touch on that a little bit more. I don't know, are any of you guys in here familiar with musky water classifications across the state? So we go through all of that on a base, uh, pretty much on a lake by lake or reservoir or river by river basis on an annual to every other semi-annual basis. So as everyone in this room knows, I'm very sure that there's been a huge and rich and long history of musky and musky fisheries and management in Wisconsin. And in fact, the number of musky anglers is increasing exponentially. So this graph is the thousands of musky anglers since 1950. And you can see it's just steadily on the increase. So this, this species in this state is becoming more and more sought after as the years go on. 
And with that, people are actually specifically targeting muskie at a rate that is very high. So we're seeing about 27 to 28 percent of the effort is directed at muskie specifically. The only other species in the state that are higher are walleye and panfish. So although muskie takes pretty specific gear, there's a lot of anglers out there that are targeting this um, species in particular. But the overall mindset of muskie anglers has really changed. So the graph, or on this graph on the left is the number of muskies harvested in the thousands, and across the uh, x-axis is the years. The open circles is tribal harvest, so you'll see that's maintained get some pointing action going on here. So you can see that this, oh, it doesn't work on the screen. This tribal harvest has stayed basically uh, constant throughout time from 1990 to 2012, but angler and recreational harvest, these blue dots, has steadily been on the decline to very few fish here into the uh, 2010, and this is continuing on. I don't, we don't have any full recent data, but we're still seeing a even lower fish are being harvested. And across Wisconsin, we have 730 waters that are currently, yep. What do you mean by harvested? Taken home and killed and either eaten or mounted. Right. No longer breathing. <laughs> um, in Wisconsin, so the, the hashed marks on the graph are the um, native range of muskie. All of the colored and hashed together are the current range. So we have 730 water bodies across the state that have muskie in them. This is 667 lakes in 46 counties. So nearly every county in the state has muskie water. Obviously not all, but the majority do. And we also have 100 river segments that are spread out across 40 counties. What's important to realize is nearly 90% of all of the muskie waters are in the north woods. So if you draw a line about around um, county US 10, US 10, north, is about 90%. So now I'm gonna jump into a little bit of our classification of musky waters. It sounds like some of you have a pretty good idea about this, but this is a really big part of what we do on the statewide level. We wanna make sure we're classifying musky waters appropriately. So has everyone seen our musky book? It's like a white book, has a musky on the front, has all the lakes in it. We hope that you as anglers are using that to understand what lakes are classified as and how you should be targeting them to fish them. So that's why we work on the classification a lot because it also, not only does it help anglers, but it informs us of how we should be managing these waters. So our class A waters are our really our premier waters and we have two different classifications in class A. We have A1, which are trophy waters. So these are waters where you'll catch fewer fish, but the fish you do catch are typically much larger and have that potential to hit 50 inches. Our A2 waters, oopsies. Our A2 waters are the exact opposite. So these are our action fisheries. You're probably going to go there and catch quite a few muskie, but on average they're not going to be that big, like 36, 37, 38 inches. <coughs> it's kind of that average size you're going to see. Then we also have our B waters, which are our intermediate waters. So these have good opportunities for fishing, but they probably don't have at least on an annual basis or semi-annual basis DNR stocking. They might have some occasional DNR stocking, but it's not regular. And then finally, we have sea waters. These are waters where muskie are present, but we're not actually managing them. So a good example is in reservoir systems where we're actually managing uh, muskie in the reservoir, but there's spillover downstream of the, of the dam into the river system. That fishery is classified as a sea but it's not managed for muskie, but it might provide a really good opportunity, and there's typically some trophy potential in these um, systems. And then within the classification, then it's followed by our reproductive category. So class one, it's all natural reproduction, there's no stocking. Class two, there's some natural reproduction, but not enough to sustain the fishery, so there's some stocking. Often private, but also DNR. Class three, there's no natural reproduction at all. So the fishery is completely reliant on having stocking in order to con continue that fishery within that body of water. And then class four, there's no natural reproduction or no stocking at all. So the fish are present, but their filtration, there's like a filtration system for them to get there. So again, that's downstream of 
reservoirs or like in chains where maybe one lake within a chain is managed for muskie, but then muskie are moving within the chain to maybe three lakes down. So we're not actually, we don't see natural reproduction, we're not stocking them there, but they're getting there via movement. So across the state, this is what we have in terms of how many lakes and uh, rivers in which class. The main thing you'll see is our trophy fish are really in these bigger <coughs> lakes, so average of about 2,010 acres for those trophy fisheries, those 50 inch plus. Our action lakes are uh, quite small, around 362 acres is the average size of those lakes. And then we have a lot of these intermediate. So the majority of our lakes are kind of in this intermediate class and they have varying sizes. Some of them are as small as under 100 acres and some of them are huge, two to 3,000 acres. And when you go out and you're you know the classification, it impacts you as an angler because it depends on what you should be prepared, mentally prepared for potentially your catch rate. So on the left is the specific catch rate or the number of muskie per hours fish, about well, number of hours per muskie. And then on the right is the mean length of um, harvested muskie. So you'll see in a, an A1, so that's a trophy lake, you're looking for those 50 inch fish in those lakes, you're gonna, it's gonna take you 42 hours before you catch a muskie typically, but the average size of those fish is gonna be close to 40 inches. Whereas in an A2, which are those action lakes, it's only gonna be about 22 hours per muskie, but the average size is gonna be somewhere around 37 inches. And then the B, which is our intermediate, is in between, and our C is has good trophy potential, like I mentioned earlier, but it takes a long time to catch the fish because we're not actively managing muskie in those um, classifications. So, since you all are on the Chippewa Flowage today, does anyone know what it's classified as? A1. A1. How about reproductive category? Some. A12, yes. So, good job. So it's a low density fishery, it has good trophy potential, um, it's a large lake so that could have been one of your good giveaways, and it has pretty diverse habitat and a good fish um, assemblage for forage base. Max will talk some more about that so I'm not getting into that much. So the other thing that really impacts muskie on a statewide um, perspective is growth and their growth potential. So this is across, this is averaging everything from the south all the way to the north average together. There's a couple, so on the left, on the y-axis is length of muskie in inches. On the x here is their age in years. A couple things I wanted to point out to you. So, at age four, most females are 30 inches. So in four years of life, they're putting on 30 inches. So they're growing really fast in those first four years. But to get those next 10 inches to get up to 40 inches, for a female, you're going to be somewhere between 9 and 10 typically, and for a male, somewhere around 12 years of age. So they grow really fast in those first four years, and then they, some of their growth goes to length, but some of it then starts going towards reproduction, so the growth isn't nearly as fast once they hit 30 inches. And another factor that plays into this is lake size. So the horizontal line is at 50 inches, so L infinity means the biggest possible length that a muskie would reach in hypothetical lake and on the x-axis here is lake acres so you'll see that sweet spot where these two lines come together right here so 50 inches in this one to one ratio is a lake that's about 2,000 plus acres so a lake that's bigger has more potential for fish to get to that 50 inch mark so here's a little quiz this muskie comes out of my area in southern Wisconsin. It's 43 inches, it's a female, and the lake's only 212 acres. Anyone have any idea how old she might be? 12. I'm bad at math. She's nine. She's nine years old. So down in, down in the southern part of the state, the fish grow faster. And it was a female, so she was growing at a faster rate given that period. Um, we don't, I shouldn't say she's 100% nine years old because this fish was not pit tagged when it came out of the hatchery. And I don't actually know if it was even a hatchery fish. My assumption is that it is. But we took an anal fin ray. So where he's holding this fish right here, 
we'll take a ray off and we'll actually be able to age it up to about age 13 to 14 accurately from that. So now I'm just going to get into a little bit about how we sample muskie populations across the state because I think it's pretty interesting and good knowledge for you guys to all know. So in lakes and reservoirs we set uh, spring spike nets. So if you can see in this picture, it might be a little far in the back. Is this, that you? No. Neither of those are me. <laughs> this is my crew though. Well, it was at the time. Um, this is my, my current full-time uh, technician, Tanya. This was my uh, LTE technician at the time. She's no longer with us, but um, this is set on an island here. You can see the net goes all the way to shore, comes out, has these uh, rectangular frames, and then these circular hoops. It's miserable, as you might be able to tell from this picture. It's not a pleasant day. So what happens is muskie go into shore during the springtime to spawn. They hit this net that's essentially like a wall. They hit the net and they parallel it. They come in here and there's a trap. They go in through the trap all the way through these hoops. And at the end, there's just a pot, like a cod end, a pot. They get stuck in that and they can't figure out how to turn back around and swim right back out of it. So we set these nets across all of the shorelines and we set them on two consecutive years after directly after ice out and we're able to sample muskies and when we're sampling them we're assessing each fish by measuring them for length weighing them we're giving we're sexing them we're clipping a fin and we're inserting a pit tag and the reason we're clipping a fin is because we want to do a mark recapture and we do fin clips also because we pit tag all the fish but we also want to do a fin clip for a couple reasons. So the first is, hopefully you guys are gonna think this joke's funny. You're supposed to laugh next. So this, <laughs> this fish is a female. You'll notice that her ventral fin right here is clipped, her right ventral fin. Females get a right clip because they're always right. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right, yeah, okay. <laughs> that joke killed at the women's muscle. Yeah, the women's They're gonna carry around the room on a chair. I thought that was great. You guys are close. So all of our female muskies get a right clip and all of our males get a left ventral clip. And the reason we give them an external clip in the south is I run an angler recap study. So all of my anglers in my area, when we do studies, they know to look for these straight across clips, and then I can run a population estimate via angler caught muskies and compare that to my two catch rates between springs. So it's a kind of a cool way to compare data across time. So we use all of this um, data, this biological data, to look at population estimates, to assess natural reproduction, and to look at body condition, because we're interested in, you know, if, we're, if our population estimates have a lot of variance, which they do for muskie typically, we want to know like how can we dial that in more, and body condition is one thing that we can really look at. So if we have a lot of fish that are not in good condition, so they're snake-like, then we might say like, oh, our population estimate is probably low, we probably have a lot of muskie in this area, either this lake or reservoir or river, and so maybe we need to cut stocking or we need to have a regulation change or etc. We're also very interested in angler sampling, so especially here in the north we have pretty good creel data, um, especially on um, ceded territory lakes for looking at angler usage, so effort, harvest, and also looking at hours spent directly um, targeting muskie via effort. So the next thing I'm going to jump into, I'm just going to touch on, because I think Max is going to talk a little bit about this, is pit tagging. So across the state, we use pit tagging as a pretty beneficial tool for our management goals. Um, hopefully, does everyone in here know what a pit tag is? No. 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 All right. So do you, ha have you, do you have a pet? Do you microchip your pet? No. No. Okay. So... Essentially what this is, is it's a passive tag. It's smaller than this dime. You can see it here in the picture. It goes under the skin and into the musculature, typically into the dorsal musculature, the cheek, or in between the uh, pectoral fins and the body cavity. We place it in there and it stays within the fish for its entire life. And in order for someone to know that it has that, we have readers that you, like, or we have arrays where they swim through and it records this 18 digit number or letters some of them have letters in them 
And that unique ID is assigned to that fish. And so we can say across time, we've seen this fish 14 times. It's been caught by six anglers who have pit tags. It gives us really good information. It's unique to that specific fish. So with that, we can often get aging data. We can get growth through time. We can look at movement, especially in like riverine systems. And we also look at harvest in some places. Beer down. <laughs> pit, pit tag. Pit tag. Okay. So the other thing is, is anglers can provide really cool citizen science data with this program, which Max is Max is gonna talk about. Yeah, did you bring it? Yeah, yeah. Is that the noise a beer makes when it dies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the, the kind of cool thing about pit tagging is we can pit tag fish as juveniles, so when they're coming out of the hatchery, and then we know exactly how old they are. Or we can pit tag them as adults and get really cool information either way. So the last big thing I wanted to touch on was muskie stocking in the state. So muskie stocking is very necessary to support a lot of the fisheries that you all probably are fishing. Um, Chippewa Flush, perfect example. So without uh, muskie stocking by both you know, the DNR and private entities, we wouldn't have nearly the muskie fishing that we do in this state. And just to give you an idea about the numbers, on an average year we stock 97,000 muskie across the state, which are always, be, they have to be 11 inches to come out of the DNR hatchery. Some years they're upwards of 12 inches. And these fish cost roughly $7 a piece. So for us to produce those fish in the hatchery, it's $7 per fish. And you know, with that, that's part of our, t as the muskie team, we have to really decide like, where do those fish go? Where are we putting that much money into the resource? And so typically it's about 115 waters that are stocked annually. Um, and most waters are on either a two or three year rotation. So it's infiltrating uh, waters in continuously. The next big thing is we're, we're really working on genetics on the team, we're trying to, keep the native genetics that are should be in each of these drainage basins present in those drainage basins. So you'll see here in the green is the Upper Chippewa River Basin, so that most of the fish coming in and out of here should be Upper Chippewa River. Upper Wisconsin here in the red, Great Lakes in the yellow, and then this blue is a universal receptor indicating that it could take any of those strains for stocking. And finally, we really want to make sure that there's sampling data to support these stocking events. So are the lakes classified correctly? Do we have data supporting that there's angler use? Do we have data supporting that the stocking is working? There's fish surviving. They're not just all dying, or they're not reaching catchable size. Are they getting to 14 inches and not growing anymore? Like We want to make sure that these things are happening. And in one, of the, one case that we really are working on right now as a team is we don't have a good source to get all of our Great Lakes strain. So currently, in order to get Great Lakes genetic strain, we're purchasing muskie from Michigan that come out of the St. Clair River system, or St. Clair and Detroit River system. But we have been stocking um, three inland lakes for with Great Lakes muskie. This is me this time. This is actually me. He's sleeping now. <laughs> I've bored him. Um, so this is a Great Lakes spotted muskie. This is a female. Um, we handled her two years ago. No, yeah, one year ago. Last spring, spring of 18. She was weighed in at 27 pounds. So we're stocking these fish into um, three inland lakes, and the hope is that we're going to be able to handle the adults, spawn them at the lake to produce, bring these this strains, eggs, and milk out of ha inland lakes and take them to our hatcheries where we won't have to buy them from Michigan. So this is one of the big ongoing projects we have. And one of the lakes is in my coverage area. So this is Big Elkhart Lake, for any of those who might be familiar with that lake. Um, it has a 50 inch um, size limit, and that's to protect these fish. There's fish caught over 50 inches every year. And it's a pretty small lake given, you know, what I, sh what I told you e earlier, but it's very deep and has a really good forage base so I'm really interested to see this year when we pull in this spring. Elkhart will be the first like we tried in. Next year. Next year. Yep, next spring. 2020.
that's all I got. Does anyone have any questions? I hope you guys enjoyed that video. I know it wasn't the most exciting topic in the world, but for some of us diehard muskie anglers, we love to hear the in-depth information on that kind of stuff. Be sure to check in to the channel for the second part of that seminar where Max Walter, the area's fishery biologist, talks in depth about the Chippewa flowage and the muskie program going on there. If you liked what you saw in this video, hit that like button. Comment down below on some of your thoughts on the DNR and their stocking programs, and consider subscribing to get more information. Thanks for watching.